Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing fine. And uh, here we are, another Friday, 12 noon, and uh, we are live with uh, Professors Fritz and Kaikedo from the University of South Carolina. Or is that? Go oh, Gamecocks. I'm wearing my shirt. I don't know if it's appearing. Stacey Juan, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Rami? Great. I'm doing, doing very well. How about you, Stacey? Doing well. Excited to be here with you. I'm uh, excited as well. I I love those sessions because not only not only like um, they're informative for the other people is because I learn a lot as well myself, and I am looking forward for uh, that discussion. And we're going to talk about the functional vital signs and how we can track our health from uh, through smart floors. So we've had smart cities, smart manufacturing. I feel like we're going into a rhythm of uh, how we can make the world a little bit more uh, more intelligent. All right, cool. Let's give it a, a little bit of time for folks to uh, join us. And um, so I can see uh, the information trickling on my, on my LinkedIn. So let's go ahead and get started with a little bit a introduction for both of you. So um, now we know we're, you're both Gamecocks at the University of South Carolina. Uh, Juan, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. So I'm the uh, uh, I'm a professor and the department chair of civil and environmental engineering. And uh, the type of research I like to do is in smart infrastructure. Uh, more specifically, I, I try to use structural dynamics to make things uh, last longer, uh, to tell us what's going on in, in structures and things like that. And uh, about 10 years ago, I started working on this idea of using structural vibrations, not only to know what's happening with the structure, but also what's happening with the people in the structure. And that's where this, uh, this idea of the smart floors uh, came, came by. So, so how, did you, how did you, before Professor Fritz introduced herself, um, so how did you like get introduced to, uh, to, to Stacy. Yeah, so, um, so it, you know, it, it was through one of their, our colleagues, uh, Victor Hurt, and uh, he is a person, uh, he's a gerontologist, he's a medical doctor, and uh, he's one of the people that uh, was the first PI, one, one of the first our projects from the Alzheimer's Association. And that first project was to identify falls. So when people fall, you have vibrations on the floor and the question was can we identify that the location of that fall and the magnitude of the force on that on that fall uh, and then uh, uh victor knew stacy and then we started talking about expanding that and stacy of course is an expert on gate uh and uh and it makes sense to expand this idea of uh people falling to people walking and what can we tell from the people or from people when they're walking yeah that's so interesting. We're going to be talking all about that. Uh, Stacy. so how is it like to work with, uh, with engineers? Well, you know, we make an interesting pair. We, we, uh, I, I would have to say there's, I've never worked with someone else, so we complement each other so well because uh, we definitely have different strengths. <laughs> um, as a, a clinician first, I've, I'm a licensed physical therapist. Um, I have worked with a variety of different populations, but I really fell in love with working with older adults and people with disability from neurological problems and assessing you how someone walks and a goal of returning to walking is often really important for them. And so you become kind of an expert in that area uh, moving along. And so it's been exciting to work with a team uh, that brings a really different and unique expertise to the group. Uh, I'd have to say that I've never submitted a grant before where I didn't understand what some of it meant because of the engineering talk uh, within the grant, uh, but it's been exciting. And it's really nice that we're both at the same university. Uh, you know, you can collaborate with people across the, the country or nation and, and or farther internationally, um, but Juan and I being close by has been a nice collaboration uh, to move this project forward. This is awesome. So, so this is, uh, I mean, I whenever you bring in and you converge knowledge from two folks that is complementary, of course, exciting things happen up. So let's go ahead and start talking. Oh, before we do that, you guys have a dream team. 
Yeah, that's absolutely the case. I mean, this is not just our work. There is a lot of people that are working on this area. And uh, one of them, of course, it's of course, Victor Hurt. Uh, he, he brings a lot about what's happening with the patient, what's happening with the person, right? Uh, we have Sachio Jang from the, uh, San Francisco State University. And uh, he also works in structural dynamics. Uh, Johanna Mejia, she's a, she's a postdoc in our grant, and she does some probabilistic methods of structural dynamics. Sorry, I'm gonna get this one. Uh, <laughs> Michelle is one of the PhD students, as, we, as well as Garrett. Uh, yeah, Michelle is a, uh, a student in uh, civil and environmental engineering, and Garrett is in, in exercise science. And we have a, a few undergraduate students. One of them is Heather O'Donnell here at, the, at USC. This is awesome. All right, cool. So I have I have a, a question, and I feel a bit ashamed. Um, what is a gerontologist? Yeah, so that's the person that uh, focuses on the uh, people of age, right? They 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 look at uh, how do you um, it, they, they have a special needs, and because of that, you want to have a person that that really focuses on that and that particular area. One of the things that I remember early on is Victor talking, for example, about exercise and how when you get to a certain age, you want to start lifting weights, but it's like a fraction of a pound or changes of a fraction of a pound to strengthen your muscles and things like that. So very very interesting. And 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 again, I'm not I'm a civil engineer. I know how to mix concrete, but not really about anything else. Uh, so it's been a really interesting cooperation with everyone. Is it is it real that uh, we stick to like? I mean, it's it's an old concept. Civil engineers, we know how to mix concrete. It's much <laughs> much much more than that. It's just like. You know, I'm a mechanical engineer, and when people say, "Oh, like, can you help me fix my car?" I'm like, "Dude, come on!" <laughs> <laughs> that is that is very true. I mean, we're using nanoparticles for materials. We're using sensors everywhere. I mean, the the old civil engineer is not is no longer the one that people think about, right? That is, it has to do with computers, with sensing, with all sort of things. Yes. So we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of things. You guys have super interesting things, and I'm not sure if uh, we're going to be able to cover all of them in this session, but hey, I mean, we can do a follow-on. So we're going to talk about walking speed as a vital sign, so how, how you know, we can assess uh, human, speed, human speed and what it means. You're going to show us some evidences and some acrosses, and then there's a test, the 10-meter uh, walk test. Why meter, not feet? That's why the, uh, <laughs> Definitely want to try to be more international, right? Be consistent with the meters. <laughs> All right, cool. So that's approximately 30 feet, a little bit more than 30 feet, right? <laughs> Correct. And, and uh, some steps forward. So let's go ahead and get started. So, Stacy, yeah. what is this about? I'm going to let Juan take this one, and I'll, uh, I'll handle the next one if that's all right. Let's do that, yes. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so the, the main idea of, of this particular project is can we really use floor vibrations to to tell something about the health status of the person? So the the, the, the idea is as you walk, uh, you, you strike the floor and those vibrations travel to the floor. And what happens is the sensors that are available now off the shell are sensitive enough to be able to pick up those vibrations. So can we design the computer algorithms and the sensing methods to be able to uh, learn about where uh, where people are walking, where are the patterns of this walking? And if this is starts changing, uh, does that mean anything in terms of health status of the person? So that's, that's the main idea or, or the overall idea. Uh, and in this particular project what we're looking at is only looking at the gait estimation. So can we from the floor vibrations, can we say something about the way that people are walking? And then later on, hopefully what we're gonna see is that that is going to be correlated with health status. Uh, Stacy has done a lot of work that showed that there is correlation between those two, but that is more in the lab environment, not in the home environment. So that's, that's one of the opportunities that this type of research is gonna offer, uh, which is to be able to know what's happening in actually people's homes. So we're talking only about vibration on the floor and not like weight? Right. So it's only the vibrations on the floor. There is no cameras. There is no sound. And that's one of the things that was attractive from uh, the, from the uh, uh, patient perspective. 
which is a, that is a little bit less intrusive than other methods of sensing, right? So if you have a microphone or you have a camera, well, there might be some sensitive areas in your house where you don't want that. Uh, but if you have something that is just looking at the floor vibrations, it's, it's a lot less intrusive. Yeah, we like to say no reasonable person wants a camera in their bathroom, right? right. Uh, we don't want to, and that's where a lot of falls and, and change in walking happens is, is in the bathroom. And so being able to sense in all rooms of the house would be really important. I completely agree. This is very interesting and also taking into account privacy and making sure that uh, we don't fall into other kinds of, uh, of, of troubles. Yeah. So what is a vital sign? So, you know, the, we started this by calling this the functional vital sign. When you think of a vital sign, uh, you know, you think of what your physician measures when you go into the hospital. It's an indicator that can predict future events and reflect kind of what's going on physiologically. So they'll measure your blood pressure and it'll give them an indication that there may be a problem or that things are looking pretty good. So it is really a summary indicator of multiple physiological symptoms. And usually there are normal and abnormal ranges. Like we know what our blood pressure should be or we know what it normally is, but we don't really know what the underlying cause is. So if our blood pressure is high, what's causing it? Is there pain? Is there stress? Is there exercise? Is there, is, is there hypertension? What's going on? And so then you have to do a differential diagnosis to figure out why is that blood pressure high? And so we're saying that walking speed could be a vital sign as well. And on the next slide, we even came up with kind of a infographic that says, okay, here's your normal vital signs, your pulse, your blood pressure, your respiration, pain and temperature. Maybe walking speed could also be one because it can be a general indicator to give us input into the underlying physiological sy symptoms. So, so, so we're talking about literally uh, like the speed at which you're walking because there is a question uh, from 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 Ravi Bora, he's asking. So all the parameters that you're considering uh, for sensing, and when we're talking about walking, we're literally talking exclusively about the speed. Is that correct? In this case, we are talking about the speed. Speed walking speed. Per, a person's self-selected walking speed. How fast they choose to walk, or their body chooses to move, is the strongest indicator of health status. And we have some additional slides that we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, there are other temporal and spatial parameters of gait, such as like how wide someone walks when they're stepping or how short their steps are, how long their steps are, that could influence as well. But what we know from the literature is that walking speed is probably the best predictor we have at this point. All right. Awesome. So let's move forward on this. So... so you know, one, one of the things that I, that I wanted to mention is the, the sensing itself, we're not sensing the walking speed. All we're sensing is the floor vibrations. And from there, we're inferring the walking speed and the other parameters. So how, how do you connect these two? I'm, I'm puzzled a little bit. Okay, so it's it, most probably I'll have to be patient. It's going to come in the slides. <laughs> right? Well, in, in, in a nutshell, in, uh, it, what, what you want to do is you develop models of your floor in a way experimental models of your floor. And based on those experimental models of the floor, you can identify where the vibrations are coming from. And if you have step after step after step, you can identify, okay, this, 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 uh, this uh, spike in vibrations come from here, these other spike vibrations come from here, and then you can reconstruct, reconstruct that where the person is walking. So this is awesome. So this is really like uh, when we assess the health of equipment, you have- right sensors at different locations and you want to see the impact or something of the kind so i'm trying to relate this with what i know in the aerospace world and some of these trials and i can see how it can uh make sense so ravi is very happy that uh this is uh you know he, he got it right and if there are any other questions by anyone feel free to uh throw it in on uh, on the chat so what are we, we're looking at that walking speed vary by age, gender, and anthropometrics, and um, when I'm hungry, going to the kitchen, stuff like that. <laughs> so what we're looking at here is, is I mentioned that a, a vital sign, there is abnormal and nab normal ranges, right? That we know what's normal and what's not. And it varies a little bit by 
uh, how old you are, as is expressed here in this graph, or your gender, or basically anthropometrics, meaning how tall you are, your leg length. So people with longer legs are going to walk a little bit faster. But for the most part, most people of most ages walk somewhere between 1.2 to 1.4 meters per second. Uh, and as we approach our 70s and 80s, we see our clients slowing down some, maybe coming below that right around 1.0 meters per second. And so it gives us a good indication of what is normal so that we know what is abnormal. And so just like we said, we use, we use vibrations to look at the health of a machine. We're now trying to use vibrations to look at the health of an indiv individual. So, so I have a question. Um, is your assessment, like I suppose your assessment is relative because each, each human have their own average. So basically what you are measuring is a variation with respect to that person because sometimes some person might be walking 1.7 and that's their normal. Absolutely. So everyone does have a little variety in their in the by themselves and we usually measure walking speed two different ways. Self-selected, which is the instructions we give is walk like you would normally. Uh, and we all kind of self-select differently. This is an example of self-selected. We right. also measure fast walking speed. So walk as quickly and safely as you can. And interestingly, what we know from the literature so far is your self-selected speed is more of a vital sign because it tells us more about where your body chooses to pick a speed versus kind of your capacity at a fast speed. So, so I have a question for you because you talked about uh, variance in walking speed. Um, Andrew is asking, what about during the day? I mean, like a person's average is not the average all day long. I mean, you walk before your coffee, it's something. And, you know, like, the, is this taken into consideration? Absolutely. So th that's a great question because, so, and it actually leads really well into our project because what we're doing is we want to assess it in a more natural environment in someone's home. Right now, we almost always assess it in the clinic. So it's a cross-sectional view of how someone walks. And it's just a snapshot. And we know it varies a little bit. So it might be time of day. It might be how we give the instructions. It might be performance. But usually it's around 0.1 meters per second in the variability of, of someone. Of course, that varies if they're on their phone, you know, and we usually carry something with us if they're carrying that hot cup of coffee. And so by moving this into the homes, we want to know, is it uh, as good of a predictor still of health status or maybe a better predictor because we're catching them in their normal environment and answering questions like does time of day matter we think will be much more obvious and evident when we can capture it a 24 7. yeah and i will add to that that it's not only the time of the day but also the space where you are and the day of the week so there might be more time it is this is like 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 physics right that is like a time space continuum that we might have to take into consideration when looking at this at this data but at this point there is no i mean other than using cameras there is not really a good way of doing it so the research that we're doing hopefully will lead into different ways new ways to do this this get analysis in, in person's uh, houses so so i mean as a follow-up question is um and you mentioned this uh stacy saying like you're still doing it and the test in the lab and you want to do it at um, the natural uh, you know uh, home of or the environment of people or at work so the question is um, is in the lab in your current testing are you doing testing with different flooring kinds or like 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 I'm trying to imagine I mean there is hardwood there is vinyl there is carpet there is and every like I can imagine like if I'm walking on a carpet um, it's gonna absorb some of I mean it's different. So in the lab right now, are you doing conducting tests with different floors or is it just like hardwood or tile? From the clinical side, we don't care about that as much. Um, we do try to be consistent when we measure someone uh, like in the hospital that we do it in the same place. Uh, so we have the same distance and the same type of flooring. From the vibration measuring side, I'll hand that over to Juan to answer that. Go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So there are differences, right? And and the reason the and those re, and the reason why we go with a model of of the floor is to be able to take into account those differences. So what we do first of all is we bring a really big hammer to a house. We put the sensors, 
And then we hammered the floor around to be able to kind of measure the relationships between the force applied to the structure in particular places and the acceleration that is produced. Uh, with that, what we can do is kind of correlate between uh, the, the force of impact and the acceleration that is being measured, and that allows us to take into consideration different structural systems, different floors. Now, there are some issues when you have, for example, uh, let's say carpet and somebody is using uh, very soft shoes or something like that, right? So in, in those cases, it's going to be very difficult to be able to, uh, to follow the, uh, the gait. Uh, but it, again, that's one of the outcomes that we hope to have in a few years is in which cases is this going to be feasible to do it and in which cases is not going to be feasible. Uh, so far, we've been able to measure in different types of floors, including carpets, uh, uh, hard floors, um, uh, uh, tile. So, so far, so good. So, so I told you uh, the next years ask a lot of questions and this is very, very dynamic. So... Uh, it's 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 never it never flows like a regular presentation, and this is what's exciting about it because really the people that are tuning in uh, they want to learn about what you're doing and they want to ask questions and I love this forum to be this way. So there's another question, and this goes to model accuracy. Yeah. I don't know who of you wants to um, answer it, but how much data is needed to reach a point to have a reliable model that can be uh, used for meaningful prediction of and meaningful correlation. Yeah, this is this is interesting, and this is something uh, something of the conversation that we're actually having in the research team right now, because what you need to do is you need to correlate the needs on in terms of identifying that walking speed difference, as well as what we can do in terms of engineering aspects. So from what I understand is that in terms of the walking speed, we need to measure differences. What was that, Stacey, 0.1 meters per second, I think is it what you mentioned before? That's about how, how well, how reliable someone is within right. themselves. So now we need to take that as a requirement for the engineering team and then try to develop an, uh, uh, an algorithm that's gonna allow us to do that. Uh, at this stage, we, we have developed an algorithm that, that uh, identifies the location of impact when that location is the place where you have hit before with the hammer when it's pending in this now to something that is continuous what i mean by that is something that is now predict the location of impact anywhere on the floor uh, we've done some numerical simulations so far and we are within that range of 0.1 meters per second uh, now what we're trying to do now is to scale that up into an experimental uh, uh, um, uh, set and then trying to find that 0.1 meters per second uh, walking speed. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, and this is awesome. I'm, uh, so, uh, so Noble, if you have further questions, go ahead and please uh, to follow up. So I didn't understand this question, but perhaps it makes more sense to you guys. So, um, so there is a follow up on um, the flooring technologies and there is works like a nest where it monitors change in behavior. I don't know if his work, if the discussion is about uh, nest, the cameras or the camera system. I, I'm not sure what it is. So does it make sense to you guys or should we ask uh, David to for further clarification? I think the nest system learns, it, it learns from the system. So as you're doing things, it kind of continues to learn. So will our system be able to learn from the user? Okay, so this is like machine learning and, and you know, some kind of, okay. I don't know why I went to the Nest system, the uh, the cameras, and uh, perhaps because I spent half of my day fixing my cameras yesterday. <laughs> All right, cool. So please keep the questions coming. We're going to switch to the second section and talk about evidence across uh, studies. So I'm going to try to start rolling the presentation for you. And if you want to be talking and um, you let us know a little bit, Great. So, so again, with a vital sign, it has to be linked to some type of physiological outcomes. And this is a chart we put together to link different walking speeds to different outcomes, uh, acti activities of daily living or hospitalization rates. And so along the bottom, you'll see uh, meters per second. And 1.4 meters per second is equivalent to, to about three miles per hour walking, if you want to think of it in miles per hour, if that works better for you. And we divide it in red, yellow, and green zones. 
And so in the red zone, Rami, if you'll go to the next slide, we kind of limited down to those. Uh, what you'll see is, is less than 0.6 meters per second. And we have a video of someone walking less than 0.6 meters per second. So you can kind of see what that looks like. And this is someone who might be extremely frail. Uh, if they walk less than 0.6, they have an increased risk of death, of hospitalization. They probably don't walk outside the home much. If they walk in this area, they're more likely to be discharged to a skilled nursing facility. So it gives you some ideas of how walking speed can be linked to function. Can you can you tell me a little bit uh, before we move forward? Um, so what what are these like? So I see these are the reasons. Is this like the percentage? So if someone is walking less than zero point six, um, can you explain to me this metric? What it Absolutely. is? Absolutely. So those are just the the different speeds that they're linked to. For example, the discharge to to uh, a skilled nursing facility that second from the bottom one is actually point one five meters per second or less. Okay. So uh, I see it. So basically, um, this is saying that um, if someone is walking at 0 0.4, most probably this is going to be connected to functional impairment, severe walking disability, or so on, or not? Exactly. Okay, good. Exactly. So it shows how it's kind of tied in with that function. And then when we move above 0 0.6 meters per second, somewhere between 0 0.6 to 1.0, we're kind of in that yellow zone. And that's still where people need intervention for fall risk. They have increased need for personal care, more likely to be discharged home because they walk a little bit better, but they still have limited community ambulation. So they can walk around the neighborhood a little bit, but probably not uh, going to the zoo and being able to walk all around or to Walmart, those type of things. And then we can move on to the green flag, which is those people above 1.0 meters, meters per second. And these people are less likely to need intervention from maybe a physical therapist. Uh, they're more likely to be able to cross streets safely in a timely manner that the, the, the street lights give us. Um, it, there's a couple of intersections in Columbia. I'm not sure people would make it across at 1.0 meters uh, per are second. We, <laughs> are we going to talk about the uh, cross from Quirinjan <laughs> to McNair every time? Yeah, exactly. My heart, and I'm like, I'm going to live another day or not. But but all of these really show you that walking speed can be an indicator of a function and how they can predict future function through multiple studies. This is awesome. So this is uh, this is a work that you guys have done through this uh, like through this effort. So this is work that I've been doing kind of throughout my career, and it's actually what brought Juan and I together because he was really interested in being able to measure this in a more natural environment, where I, where most of these types of measurements were done from in a clinical environment or in a very lab-based environment. So, so is that the reason why there are gaps in it? So basically, no people were measured uh, in, like, why 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 is there gaps? Sorry, my <laughs> OCD is asking, not me. No, that's okay. So the, the, the gaps are, are, I think, represent gaps in our knowledge at this point, is, is we know some things about walking speed, um, yeah, and uh, we probably can learn a lot bit, a lot more, uh, and hopefully fill this chart in a lot more to be able to guide therapists and maybe guide physicians to know where their patients are when they're at a certain level. So if you can go back to that vital sign and you think maybe you think of this as like blood pressure, well, okay. we know at 20 over 80, we're in a pretty healthy zone. But if we're at 140, maybe we, we aren't as healthy and we need to look at, at different interventions. And so that's the type of thing here. Well, maybe if we're at less than 1.0 meters per second, we need to look at different interventions. Do we need to seek out a rehab to make sure that we're safe and that we're progressing? Yeah. And one of the things that is interesting about, to me, this is all fascinating, by the way, as, as an engineer. Uh, but the part that is even more fascinating is the chart that you just were showing is valid, from what I understand, it's only valid in a clinical uh, 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 practice, right? Because the person has been asked to walk, and when you ask to walk, you change your behavior. But if you think now about the capabilities of uh, do, being able to do this at an office or in a house or in, in where, where people live, now you have a chart that is more three-dimensional, right? Where you have now... Uh, uh, space and time of the day and all of those things uh, coming into into factor. So it, it can really expand the way that, that this is viewed uh, from a clinical perspective. Right. So, I so think you saw my, uh, 
you stole the next question. I, I wanted to put my industrial engineering hat and I mean, in ergonomics, whenever I uh, used to teach uh, ergonomics, there was a whole chapter on uh, operator rating and how you should rate an operator without the operator knowing that they are being uh, observed because the mere fact that they know they are being assessed changes everything. So, right. so this is uh, like, I think th this raises to that point. Stacy, you wanted to say something? Yeah, and I, well, I think what you said actually complements it really well. So these findings are robust when we're they know we're observing them. So I'm excited to find out how robust our findings will be when they don't, because I feel like it'll give us a bet, even better indicator of health status uh, when the observation is is not known. Awesome. So this is a little bit uh, the flow between. So um, is. Is the reason why we're moving from four to three to two, it's the models that they yeah, start so the, modeling? Exactly. These were from different studies, and there's been less studies, of course, in age people between 90 and 100 uh, on walking speed. But this just shows that as we do age, it goes down. And so with all their uh, other vital signs, they change with age. And so we do expect this. But what we can't do in this study uh, is kind of sit around and wait for people's walking speed to get worse. But we want to make sure it still changes so we're able to know if our system is working. And so that actually kind of leads into uh, the reason we're doing the study, the reason we've set up the study the way we have is we're going to follow people after they come out of the hospital and watch them get better because okay. they're going to get better faster than if we waited around for them to get worse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, we started the study in 1862, and here we are presenting the findings. I mean, it might take a bit of time. <laughs> but in that case, we need to know those abnormal and normal ranges of what walking speed is and other gait parameters so that we can know if they've, quote unquote, gotten better. That's awesome. So this is uh, very good. So um, this, what, what is this study about? Okay, so, so these studies just kind of go on to tell a little bit more of the breadth and depth of walking speed. Again, when we're even observing it in a contrived environment. And so they, this was a study done by Stephanie Studinsky about 10 years ago, and she's a geriatrician. Now that you know what that is, uh, yeah. she, um, it is a, a survival analysis. She took about 35,000 adults and they're summarized on the next slide. They put all these different studies together and it's stratified by walking speed. So uh, you'll see the red, yellow, and green walking speed. There's, uh, and along the bottom is days to death, which is not something we normally deal with as, as uh, physical therapists, but physicians do look at this a lot. And so what we're doing is looking at people's score stratified by walking speed. And so if you'll just kind of click through that, Rami, It'll show you the different walking speeds, the red zone, less than 0.6, the yellow zone, and then the green zone where we're happier to kind of see people at, at, at that speed above 1.0 meters per second. And if we take that days to death, uh, and keep, keep on clicking for me a couple more times, what you'll see is that eight and a half years is the day I chose just for this example. That's about 3,000 days to death. So if Eight and a half years ago, you walked at less than 0.4 meters per second, only uh, 55 to 60% would be alive. If eight and a half years ago you walked in that yellow zone, only 70 to 85% would be alive. And if eight and a half years ago you were in the green zone, 90 to 95% would be alive. So just walking speed alone is predictive of length of life. And that it actually is a better predictor than BMI, smoking status, uh, history of cancer. It's unbelievable the robustness of this vital sign. Down with the BMI. I'm, I'm, I'm glad <laughs> I like that. So, so, I, so Noble is asking another question: Is um, if we did if we do determine that a person's walking speed is slower, what are the available interventions? Uh, do you have the magical uh, lock for the fridge at their house or something? Of the <laughs> so that's a great question, Noble. So um, what we know is if walking speed is slow, we need to have that person further examined to figure out why. 
is it a strength issue? Is it a balance issue? Is it a sensation issue? Is it a, is it a, a cognitive issue? So there could be a lot of underlying physical, physiological factors that play into that slowed walking speed. And that's exactly why we talk about it as a vital sign, because then you have to do a differential diagnosis. So let's say it's speed related. It could easily go to a physical therapist and work on, uh, I'm sorry, it's strength related. We go to a physical therapist and work on strength to help improve their ability to walk faster. This is so interesting. This is really, fa I mean, it's a totally different perspective on um, on health assessments. I mean, you mentioned BMI, everybody, it's like so generic. I'm imagining that, um, so, uh, so like I'm thinking as you're presenting, right? And one of the things you're saying is, is you're trying to assess it through the floor. Isn't it easier to assess it through wearables? Like, I mean, just like your Fitbit or something of the kind. And and my follow-on question is, if such a metric, I mean, this is validated with science and everything. Of course, it's one with other compounds, but if it's used, it can um, really, you know, like alarm people that, hey, because I hate, I hate to say what I'm going to say next. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to be like so frank about it. You get used to weight and BMI because everybody talks about this and you reach a point where you accept it. Like you reach a point where you say, okay, my BMI is not good. You know, I'm just gonna move on. But this metric is a little bit more, um, how to say it, scarier in the sense that, hey, according to statistics, this is how you're walking now. So whatever you've been doing got you to the point where most probably you are 3,000 days away from death. Mm. And that is far more stronger as a statement than, um, than, than, than BMI. What do you think about this? Should we go on scaring people or? Yeah, yeah I think that's an interesting approach. I mean, there are definitely survival analysis with a lot of different functional outcomes. So walking speed is not unique in that sense. But uh, I think it it is different to address because there could be a lot of different factors that play into it. So a lot of times it can be a healthcare decision, you know, needed to address it. So maybe they can't walk fast enough because they have COPD or chronic obstructive lung disease. And so we need to work on their lung disease to be able to get them to be able to breathe better so they can walk faster. Or maybe they can't walk faster uh, because they have AFib, uh, atrial fibrillation, and they have heart issues and they need to see their physician to get that under control so that they're able to then walk faster. So there's a lot of other underlying conditions that could influence their speed to walk. But I do think just like we encourage patients to self-monitor blood pressure, knowing your walking speed and being able to self-monitor that. And with a system like this, we might be able to do that more can help us kind of move forward in, in giving control of health back to the patient. Yeah. So, so, so I agree with you. And I know that these assessments, they exist. And the point that I was trying to make is that the others were so accustomed to them. This mm -hmm. one, you. And for me, that is what might play the difference because um, like what you know, sometimes you don't really fear because you're accustomed to it. And this is something like a different perspective on things. So I think this is in continuation of what we're talking about. I mean, if you take uh, if you take the uh, the speed at which you're walking and you're looking where you're starting from and you're at the speed. Well, we're looking at the survival rate in here and the numbers are, you know, are what they are, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So this just takes it one step further and it divides it by age and sex. So this is a this is the male chart and age. So if you have a 70 year old uh, that walks at about 1.5 meters per second or 1.0 meters per second, they're predicted to live 14 more years. And then if you have that same 70 year old who walks in the green zone at 1.4 meters per second, their expectation is an extra six years. So by taking, adding age and sex into the model, we can be a little bit more predictive with walking speed. I guess this is the female chart and these are- uh, This the is also the male chart. And so it takes that same uh, same person at the same speed, so, uh, sorry, hey. the same person at the same speed, <laughs> a 70 year old, uh, that, that walks at 1.0 meters per second will live to 84. But if they make it to 80, 
if they're still walking at 1.0, then they can make it eight more years. So being able to maintain your walking speed as you get older is really important because you're gaining more, more functional capacity in more years. And so a system like this where you can say, oh, I'm starting to lose some of that speed. I need to continue to work on it and find out what, what I need to work on uh, would be important. Uh, this is just another graph demonstrating the exact same thing. Uh, this is actually predicted five-year survival rate. So if you're a 65-year-old, uh, you, you would live, uh, if you're walking in the red zone at 65, you would live, you're, you're predicted to, only 75% of them would live five more years, but 95% would live uh, if you're in the green zone. So it kind of gives you that same indication. And then this is male and female compared. We do know that women tend to live longer than men. Uh, so the big like take home message here is really walking speed with age and sex can be a really strong predictor of survival. And if it's already this strong when we're when we're manipulating how we collect it in a contrived environment, we're, I really think Juan and I really believe that being able to collect it continuously, not just at a cross sectional one time into the doctor, can give us more information and really improve these even farther. This is awesome. So, so, so we've talked about uh, we've talked about how this correlation happens, how we want to do it. Um, let's uh, jump into the ten meter uh, walk test and understand what that is. And I yeah, think so I just... you're gonna have me stand and test myself and try to walk ten meters now. <laughs> we definitely could do that. This is just to show you how simple it is to measure it in our in our lab or clinic. And so we just really mark off 10 meters. We actually use a 20 meter path, five minutes to speed up, or five meters to speed up, 10 meters walking, five meter deceleration zone. We start the patient at the beginning of the 20 meter line and we ask them to walk all the way across. Uh, and we just time during those central 10 meters. This gives us walking speed. It's a simple uh, distance uh, by time to walk. And so it really gives us an idea but you can imagine if this happens once a year, there's gonna be a lot moving and changing around that. If we could do this continuously and capture someone's walking, it would really give us a lot more information. I want to run the animation one more time because it's very clear how much, how hard you worked on this chart. It's awesome. So. <laughs> I like to get the little animations to help explain the story a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important. I mean, uh, I often say that to our students that communication is your body language, your speech, but also your charts should, you know, be able to uh, communicate. So mm -hmm. basically, this is your measurement technique. And then after that, what are the steps forward? That's great. So so that's really where we're at now. And we've kind of been hinting at it and, and spoiler alert about really how do we move this forward? And it, can we make this a better either either be able to measure it easier or measure it more often. And I think that's really where we're going with this and, and, and where Juan has really come into the picture. Yeah. So I might yeah. hand it over to, to you at this point, Juan. Yeah, so one of the things that you mentioned earlier, Rami, was why not use wearables, right? It's so simple. Just 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 put your Fitbit on or your I, uh, Apple, uh, Apple Watch and, and you're done. Well, not really, because the problem is for some of the populations that were interested, um, these type of technologies don't really work. Uh, take, for example, a person that has Alzheimer's. Uh, well, this person is going to forget to charge the smartphone or the, or the smart device. They're going to forget to wear it in the mornings. Uh, even if you go and you oh, get up, I hate, I hate to break it, but it doesn't have to take Alzheimer's to forget to charge these things. <laughs> Mine, mine is, needs recharge since I don't know when. <laughs> it's sitting here, so. <laughs> Um, so I mean that, but you, you know exactly right. So that that kind of uh, um, exemplifies why we want to do something that is more environmental. It's not necessarily something that is dependent on the person using it. The other thing is, you know, if, as we've seen uh, so far, this walking speed has been done in these ten meter uh, long runways. Uh, homes don't have these 10 meters long runways. So the data that we're gonna collect is different. And it is, I, my intuition tells me, and this is this is where we're, we're gonna know in a few years if this is the case or not. There might be some other cases that are interesting. Like for example, 
if you if you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom that might be actually a very good time to measure your walking speed because you do it in a consistent way uh you do it maybe at the same time or close to the same time at night or when you get up in the mornings and you're gonna go and make coffee in the mornings uh well it it is is part of this consistent uh, uh, a part of your day, and 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 we might be able to capture that information then. So we're gonna have to, uh, from the engineering point of view, uh, we're gonna we're gonna enable the uh, um, the um, uh, physical therapists and the uh, medical doctors to collect this data, and uh, and then expand what they've done. I mean, they've done a really great job in terms of walking speed, but really expand that. Uh, to to other domains, so we're getting into the heart of it. So yeah, go ahead. So 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 here, what are we looking at? So this is the vibrations generated by people when they're walking. What's the exactly difference the upper one and the bottom one? It, yeah, so I mean, if if you look at records of people walking and people's of, of records of people doing something else, they look really different. So the one on, on top is just one sensor. Uh, uh, in a floor, and you see that th as the person gets closer to the sensor, the acceleration measurements get bigger, because the person is getting closer, and as the person walks away from the sensor, the acceleration measurements go down, get, get, get smaller. Uh, but if there is any other type of activity, uh, let's say that the person just dropped a book or uh, is doing something else, well, the, the acceleration measurements really look, look different. So. Um, just in, in this part, there is already a lot of research that we have to do because we're going to start collecting acceleration measurements from the floor. We're going we're gonna to have to distinguish what of those records are because of a person walking or which one of those are because of something else. So that, that has been our, our first step on, 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 the, on the research that we do. So what can we do? So right now, what can we do in terms of the research? Well, we can uh, we can estimate forces on the impact of, of floors, which is quite interesting. Uh, what you see there is an experiment that we did on an, an actual floor, and the line that says actual is is the is the force that was recorded with an impact hammer. So we we have a measurement of the force, and the other signals are what we estimated from four different accelerometers. So we can really estimate the force of the impact on floors using using the technology that we are developing and we also can estimate the location of where that input impact has happened in floor so that's what we can do so far this is awesome and uh, tons of people are saying messages such as thanks great info and so on so uh, feel free we still have a couple of uh, minutes to go if anyone has any questions, that's your opportunity. So feel free to uh, to go about it. So we want to talk about human activity a little bit in here and the characterization of like um, human induced vibration. So what is it that uh, you like? What is this map? What is this uh, this map? Talk to us a little bit about it. Yes, and this goes back to the discussion that we were, we were having earlier about the time of day, right? So let me tell you what this is. This is a, some data that we collected several years ago when my kids were about uh, two, three years old, okay? So this is in your house? This was in my house, yes. Uh, I like I like to have my kids as guinea pigs, what can I say? Uh, so Me too, uh, me too. Yeah. But, uh, I use them to taste the, f the food that I cook. So <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it doesn't go so well. No, if I do that, I might actually be harming them. So yeah, this is just floor vibrations. <laughs> uh, no, okay. So in this case, we had two sensors in our living room, and we collected data for several months. And what you see there is the amount of activity, and this is just the number, the number of, of, of records that were above some level. So they're extremely basic type of metrics. And when you see um, in the in the chart on the right, on the right, you see Sunday through Saturday, and in the vertical axis you see the hours of the day. Uh, blue indicates that it, there is not much activity, and red indicates that there is a lot of activity. And it's extremely interesting because you see you can really tell the, the pattern of our family when when the kids were that age. They they used to wake up and they used to come down the stairs around seven, and that's when you see the activity going up. They will take a nap in the middle of the day, and you see that's when the activity goes down. Then they have lunch, and then they have another nap in the afternoon, wake up, 
you know, do a little bit, a little bit of noise, and they, they go to bed. Uh, I'm trying to like, decipher yeah. the dynamic of the dynamics of your family. I'm trying to like uh, re reverse engineer the the chart. So I, I want to ask you a question. Um, have you tried to see like so? You're measuring the number of events per time, right? Uh, you, I mean, compute the total amount of events in a day and try to see like why is Tuesday different from Wednesday and stuff like that? Yeah, we've done some of that some of that work and what you really can tell is, for example, the differences between uh, a work day versus the weekend, right? You can really tell things like that, that it, it, that is very easy. You can tell, for example, there was a period of time where we were on vacation and you can really tell, right, there is no one at home, literally no one at home because the house is just quiet, there is nothing happening. Uh, so you can actually tell a lot about what's happening in, in somebody somebody's home uh, by looking at some information. And again, this is this is basically raw data that we just plotted uh, just by looking at the numbers, a uh, 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 number of activity uh, uh, per hour. This is so. What is next? So if you click one more time, I think there's a chart that will show up there. And this is this is what we hope to be able to arrive. Okay. So if you invite us again in a few years, hopefully. We can do a demonstration of, of this. And what we hope to be able to arrive is something like this. If you see, this is like a plant view of a floor. And what we hope to arrive is to be able to show you not only the location where we think it is, but also the uncertainty in the location of each step. Because the uncertainty in the location of each step is going to be extremely important. If, it, if the uncertainty is too high, was what the what the methodology is telling us is don't trust this data, just throw it away, wait for the next time that the person is gonna walk by. If the uncertainty is small, and you can see something like that, right? You might be able to see that the green dots are, for example, your your right foot, your left, uh, your uh, red dots is your, your uh, the other foot, and you just start walking and seeing that actually the person walk through the floor with the time stamps. And if you are able to do something like this, then now you can calculate walking speed. You can calculate the distance between left, uh, uh, the left foot and your right foot, and all the other type of parameters that now people can use to do something uh, in terms of uh, health status. I have a very tough question coming your way. How do you deal with data from a multi-person home, and how Absolutely. do you plan to distinguish the data per person? I like this question a lot. It's, it's excellent. This, it is one of the things that we really are uh, very um, aware because the problem with this is you don't, you don't want to start measuring the wrong person for many reasons, right? Uh, so two type of um, um, strategies that we're following on this. The first one is we have developed some machine learning to uh, identify whether or not the signal that we see is from one person or multiple people. If it's multiple people, throw it away. That is, the person is going to walk back from the kitchen at some point or something like that. So we're basically discarding a lot of the data that we know that we cannot use. Then the other thing that we're trying to do is, since each person is going to have a different gait pattern, we're trying to learn the gait pattern and then identify the person by that gait pattern. So using what we are predicting itself to be able to do the classification of the different people. This is awesome. So I think we're wrapping up with our last chart and um, we are just perfectly on time. So what are the spatial temporal variations of at-home gate monitoring? So the big conclusion. Right, so that's, that's actually what we hope to do at the end, right? To be able to say, oh, we've learned that, for example, the best place to install the sensors is in the hallway between the bedroom and the kitchen because when every morning the person goes and drinks a glass of water or something like that, that is the place to be able to do. So that's, that's going to be the spatial aspects of it. We might learn, for example, that the mornings are the best time to do this or the evenings or somewhere in the middle of the day or uh, uh, maybe not on the weekends because there is too many things happening. So all of these questions about this time, time space variations, we're going to learn about them and hopefully we, we can get an answer uh, about it at the end of the project. This is the next level of uh, smart and intelligence. I mean, this uh, I can imagine if you connect such a thing with uh, your Alexas and whatnot, uh, I can imagine what it can deduce and so on. So 
This was awesome. This was nothing short of awesome. I want to ask everyone that is um, so. So I want to ask everyone that is uh, online now to um, press this little clap button and send a big thank you to uh, to to Juan and Stacy for this uh, amazing discussion. You know, my own metric is if at the end of the chat I've learned something and I've gained my knowledge, I feel so happy from a session and I've learned a lot today. So this is really, really genuinely awesome. And plus now I know uh, what's your research point. So next time we meet, uh, you know, we can, I can, we can further discuss the conversation. Um, Juan, Stacy, any last words you want to say? Thank you for inviting us. I mean, this is this is always fun to be able to talk about the project and stay tuned. I think there's a lot of stuff that is going to happen within the, the next few years of this. Well, I'm looking forward to follow up on this. Stacy. is there anything you'd like to say? No, just uh, thank you very much. It's it's fun to do different forums and, and get the word out there. Uh, we're excited about this project and, and excited to see where it takes us. Thank you so much for both of you. Um, we still have three next lives this season. We've been on a run. We've been, this is number eight or number nine. Um, so uh, all the topics, super exciting. We still have three uh, sessions to go. And thank you so much for tuning in. And we talk again next Friday. Stacy, Juan, thank you so, so much. And have a great rest of the day. Thank, thank you. you too. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye, everyone. Ciao. Bye.